Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we begin with question number one from Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with the National Transport Strategy and the Strategic Transport Projects Reviews. Minister Hamza Youssef. The National Transport Strategy Review is progressing on schedule. All of the working groups are taking forward their respective remits. Our stakeholder engagement programme is also progressing to plan. Uh, just last week, I attended a national transport event co-led by colleagues in COSLA to engage with newly elected councillors. Uh, the Strategic Transport Projects Review uh, is being informed by the National Transport Strategy and is also proceeding as planned. Can I thank the Minister for that answer. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment last year to improve the A75 as well as links between Dumfries and the A74. Having advocated these improvements in my own submission to the National Transport Strategy, can I ask the Minister how soon we will know what specific road improvement projects in the South West will be committed to in the Strategic Transport Projects Review? Minister. Can I thank uh, the Member for her question? She'll remember from the Programme for Government by the First Minister, uh, we reaffirmed our commitment to commence uh, this year for the uh, work for the second STPR uh, in the Dumfries and Galloway area. This work will consider the rationale improvements, not just to road, but also to rail, to public transport, active travel on the key strategic corridors, particularly the A75 and the A77, but also rail corridors to Stranraer and Kaleo via Kilmarnock uh, to Dumfries. Just this week, I've met with the A77 Action Group, uh, but also discussion around the A75 as well. Before that, uh, also a cross-party meet uh, meeting the weekend, the week before uh, on the A77 as well. So I'm very, very confident that the Fries and Galloway, the A77, the A75, those two strategic roads in particular, uh, getting a lot of attention, some studies, some work being done in order to bolster the case for future investment. But clearly the member will understand that the STPR has to go through a, a process for review. Uh, and I welcome uh, her thoughts and her comments on that. And Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister if the National Transport Strategy will help or hinder the Government's ambitions on reduced emissions and climate change, and if he thinks it will bring about any monumental uh, steps in modal shift in Scotland? Minister. I certainly do, but what I would say also to the members is that we won't wait for the National Transport Strategy uh, to necessarily take forward some of the work we're already doing. The PFG, the First Minister, was incredibly strong, of course, on uh, our, our intention to uh, phase out the need for petrol and diesel cars by 2032, a draft climate change plan, which I know uh, the member has also commented on, a very useful contribution that he's made to that in order to ensure that transport uh, emissions are reduced. So we'll continue on that vein of work, uh, but of course, uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions will inherently be part of the National Transport Strategy. And again, I'd welcome his thoughts on that. Question number two, Mary Fee. Ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of the Gypsy Traveller Strategy and Action Plan. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Signing officer, the Scottish Government recognises that gypsy traveller communities are among the most disenfranchised and discriminated against in Scotland. We will publish a race equality action plan by the end of this year that includes specific Scottish Government led activities for gypsy travellers, which will be followed by a detailed programme of work for the community. And I look forward to informing Parliament about our proposals for work in this very important area when we do so. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that um, update? Gypsy travellers are a protected group under equalities legislation. And despite this, as the Cabinet Secretary said, they remain one of the most marginalised and discriminated groups in Scotland. Social attitude studies show little change in the deeply entrenched views against them. The first inquiry this Parliament carried out was in 2001. And subs subsequent inquiries have shown little change in their living conditions or their lives. The gypsy traveller community feel let down and ignored by politicians, both nationally and locally. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with representatives of the gypsy traveller community to hear firsthand the issues they face? And further, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to take direct control of the issues to make some progress to help this community? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I thank Mary Fee? Mary Fee has been a real champion and advocate for the gypsy community uh, for many years now. And actually, we need more people uh, to act in the fashion uh, that Mary Fee has done. She's absolutely uh, correct to uh, underline um, the issues raised uh, in, 
and often in Scottish Social Attitudes Survey. Uh, I'm very conscious that the Equalities and Human Rights Commission uh, describe attitudes towards the gypsy traveller community uh, often as the last bastion uh, of respectable uh, racism. Uh, I will indeed uh, meet with members of the community. As indicated uh, in my answer, there will indeed be Scottish Government-led uh, action. I'm very conscious of two previous committee inquiries and we now need to get on with the delivery uh, of that action. As I said, I look forward uh, to informing uh, Parliament of that work um, in uh, due course. But if I can say to Mary Fee and others, uh, we've been working very hard on the race equality delivery plan um, and been open to the advice and support and indeed the challenge uh, from our race equality advisor, uh, Callie Annie Lyle, uh, amongst others. Question number three, Joanne Lamond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Shelter Scotland's appeal to alleviate homelessness. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, we agree with uh, Shelter Scotland's call to alleviate homelessness this winter, and their latest report contains more evidence that UK government welfare cuts are causing major hardship and housing insecurity for many people. And that's why we've established the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, which includes shelter, with the objectives of ending rough sleeping and transforming temporary accommodation. The Action Group has already been working hard on its first objective of minimising rough sleeping this winter, and I'll receive their practical recommendations on the actions we must take shortly. It will then focus on its other questions on ending rough sleeping, transforming temporary accommodation, and ending homelessness. And we are supporting this approach by creating the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund over the next five years. Joanne Lamond. Can I thank the Minister for that reply? Given the wide range of causes of homelessness and not just rough sleeping, the Scottish Government must be aware of the importance of support services to prevent homelessness and to prevent failed tenancies where these have been secured. And I wonder if the Minister recognises that an understanding of the scourge of homelessness must be matched by the resources to tackle and prevent it. And in that vein, can I ask what representations he has made to the Finance Secretary to reconsider the disproportionate cuts to local government over many years, cuts which make it exceptionally difficult for these lifeline services to be sustained and with the untold misery for those who may find themselves homeless as a consequence? Minister. Uh, President Officer, the Finance Secretary has treated local government fairly uh, over many years and uh, that included increasing uh, funding for local services by some £400 million last year. As I pointed out in my original answer, um, presiding officer, uh, we also have from the finance secretary um, the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund, which I will think will go a long way in helping uh, out. But what I would really like to see is the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, standing up at his budget and abolishing the benefit cap, reintroducing housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds and ending austerity, because that would be really helpful indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And Ben McPherson. Thank you. Uh, can I ask the Minister what effect the UK Government's benefit cap, as just mentioned, is having on increasing the risk of homelessness for low-income families, as has been the case for several families in my constituency? And can I also ask what action the Scottish Government is taking to pressure the UK Government to protect households from further austerity? Minister. Um, President officer, this government will continue to put pressure on the UK government to end austerity. Um, I hope that the Chancellor has heard what I have had to say today and has, will listen to my colleagues uh, as we move forward. Um, the Scottish government continues to oppose the benefit cap, which is clearly impacting hardest on low-income families with children. And that's why we have called again and again on the UK government to reverse this unacceptable policy. Uh, the latest DWP figures show that at August 2017, around 3,800 households were affected by the benefit cap, containing over 11,000 children. In September, a Scottish Government report highlighted 30% of, fa of families affected by the cap in Scotland are lone parents with three children, losing up to £3,320 per year. It is about time that the Chancellor listened. It's about time that they reversed their decisions on the benefit cap, uh, on uh, abol uh, abolishing uh, 
housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds and it's about time they got a grip with universal credit which is failing families right across this country. Question number four, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had regarding the rollout of Freestyle uh, Libra glucose monitoring system in light of it being available in the NHS in England and Wales. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Uh, following due process, the flash glucose monitoring device Freestyle Libra has been included on the Scottish drug tariff, tariff from the 1st of November 2017. As with all other prescriptions on the tariff, NHS boards must ensure that prescriptions are appropriate, evidence-based, safe and cost-effective. It's essential that investment is used wisely to maximise the health benefit to patients. Given the limitations of the current evidence base uh, to support a consistent approach across boards, the Scottish Diabetes Group has provided advice to help identify people who should be considered for NHS-funded freestyle Libra across Scotland. The advice is broadly in line with Diabetes UK consensus guideline. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that free, uh, Freestyle Libra is a form of flash glucose monitoring through a small sensor worn under the skin and reduces the need for frequent fingerprint blood tests. I understand the NHS placed it on the NHS drug tariff, as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier this month. When will it be available for each and every health board in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, as I said in my initial answer, I mean, the listing of a, a medical device in the drug tariff um, it, isn't, shouldn't be interpreted as a recommendation to prescribe a particular product. What's important is that patients will need to discuss the ongoing management of their condition with their healthcare professional and consider whether flash glucose monitoring is suitable for them. Uh, as I say, the, the guidelines that have, um, uh, that have been uh, developed by Diabetes UK uh, is very consistently uh, in line with the Scottish Diabetes Group advice uh, that is really to help clinicians identify people who should be considered for NHS funded freestyle Libra. So it's really a clinical decision. So not everybody, as I'm sure the member will appreciate, would be suitable uh, for, for using uh, uh, this uh, device. So um, I will certainly uh, be very happy to keep the member updated as, as this matter goes forward, but it is for uh, patients to discuss initially with their clinicians about whether or not they're suitable for this. Question number five, Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the dyslexia, dyslexia and Inclusive Practice Professional Recognition Pilot. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. I'm delighted that through the £200,000 grant funding the Scottish Government provided to Dyslexia Scotland this year, we've been able to support the development of this pilot. The pilot responds to the recommendations made in the 2014 Education Scotland Making Sense report and was developed in partnership between the Scottish Government, Dyslexia Scotland, the Addressing Dyslexia Toolkit Working Group, Education Scotland, the General Teaching Council of Scotland and the Open University. I can confirm that 30 teachers representing 24 local authorities are participating. The first of three master classes was held on the 30th of September and another two master classes will be held next year. Further support will be provided through online GLOW sessions. The pilot will run until October 2018 and we intend to have a final evaluation by the end of December 2018. Margaret Mitchell. I thank the, the Minister for that detailed response and say that I very much welcome this pilot. However, is she aware that independent schools were not included within the pilot's parameters and can she confirm why this was the case? if this omission can be rectified, uh, because clearly participation from a wide group of stakeholders is most beneficial. Minister. Well, I, I appreciate uh, Margaret Mitchell's work um, on this issue over a long period of time. I'm more than happy to look into the detail of that. I should say that there are a number of ways that, that teachers um, can um, improve their uh, professional learning er, um, around the areas of dyslexia. That includes the Addressing Dyslexia uh, Toolkit, which I mentioned. And there are further online training modules that teachers and support staff can register and take part in. Uh, but I'm more than happy to take up any detailed specifics um, of areas that we still need to address on this issue to broaden out that professional learning. Question number six, Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the Parliament passing the Scottish Liberal Democrats amendment in October, following the debate on active travel unanimously, what action is it is taking to ensure that every child in the country has access to cycling proficiency training? Minister Hamza Yusuf. I, I of course uh, welcome the member's <laughs> amendment to the Scottish Government's uh, motion. I have to say, Presiding Officer, in the last uh, two debates that I've led 
in this parliament. I find myself uh, agreeing with Mike Rumbles on a number of occasions, despite, oh despite, my, uh, sad, sad. despite my better uh, instincts, uh, perhaps. Uh, we have, for a number of years, provided funding to Cycling Scotland for bikeability Scottish cycle training uh, for all primary school children in Scotland. This year, we're investing around about £800,000 for this training. Uh, on the back of the amendment that uh, was accepted, uh, you will know, of course, that uh, we have doubled, uh, will double, of course, uh, our spread in active travel. I think it would be fair to assume that a reasonable proportion of that uh, should uh, go towards ensuring uh, that the ambitions in the Liberal Democrats' amendment uh, are met. <laughs> Earlier this month, I met with Cycling Scotland and a number of stakeholder uh, organisations on active travel to discuss this very issue. And I've asked that Cycling Scotland redouble its efforts to promote uh, this funding to local authorities and to schools. And of course, any ideas that the members have, member has, I would be happy to listen to. Mike Grumbles. Well, I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive response and grateful for his support for the issue. Could he just outline when he thinks that the, the whole programme might eventually be com completed, how long it will take to achieve? Minister. Well, I'll try to give a little bit more detail as we develop that, and I'll keep the member updated because he'll, he'll understand from doubling the, the, the budget and active travel, we want to ensure, frankly, that we get as much bang for the buck. So we're uh, talking to, to active travel stakeholders. We're looking at international comparisons. We're looking at UK comparisons uh, to see uh, where we can uh, hopefully uh, meet those ambitions. In terms of uh, bikeability in our, in our primary school uh, children, uh, you know, the, the year 2016-17, we now do have a record number, 36,711 children taking part in that. But like his amendment, we want to see much, much more than that. So I'd well endeavour to keep the member updated. I should say, in terms of increasing cycle rates, uh, we are putting a lot of effort, of course, uh, into uh, our young people to, to get them more active on active travel. But certainly, it should just not be seen as something uh, for young people. Uh, I, should, I would recommend active travel and cycling to those of, uh, of a vintage disposition. Yeah, thank you. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. Um, <laughs> the, uh, following on from that, Presenting Officer, um, in, in teaching our children to cycle safely, it would, it would imagine that we need to create an environment where there are safe places for children to cycle. Um, I wonder if, if the Minister could, could uh, take a look at how we can create an environment around about our schools where uh, our children have the opportunity to cycle to and from school. Minister. I think he, the, the member makes the point well, and I think I remember him saying in the active travel debate, uh, around his own family circumstances and how more com comfortable uh, he would be uh, if there was a segregated cycle pass, uh, something that this government uh, certainly uh, believes uh, will make our roads safer. So I can give him that guarantee that we'll continue to invest through our Community Links and Community Links Plus project uh, on, on uh, segregated cycle paths. Uh, what I would say is that the bikeability, the, the, what was previously known as proficiency test, uh, also has an element of on-road training as well, which I think is excellent for children. And he'll also know, of course, our guidelines our recommendations to local authorities uh, around 20 mile per hour zones around schools, uh, which we think uh, are, of course, a great idea. But if the member has further ideas of how we can improve uh, safety on our roads, particularly for those around uh, travelling to our schools, uh, then, of course, I'm all ears to listen to that. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, can the minister tell us how per capita spending on active travel in Scotland compares with that that prevails elsewhere in the UK? Minister. After our active travel debate last week, I asked that very question to try to, to examine the figures myself. Uh, and from next year, uh, when we have the increase in the active travel budget, uh, we will spend at least £14.80 uh, per head uh, of population in Scotland on active travel. Uh, in England, if we exclude uh, London, it's £6.50. In Wales, it's estimated to be between £3 and £5. And Northern Ireland, to quote Cycling UK, the spending is, quote unquote, limited and spread very thinly. So, again, I'm pleased to say that Scotland leads the way in this endeavour. Question number seven, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to improve the availability of electric car charging points in housing estates. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, the Member will know, of course, that, I have, that we have the Switched On Scotland uh, Action Plan, which takes forward our ambitions in terms of uh, electric charging points. And, of course, uh, we have announced in the programme for government our increased ambition to phase out the need for electric, uh, sorry, I should say phase out the need for petrol and diesel cars <laughs> by 2032. <laughs> Luckily, I corrected that, I hope, uh, for the record. Richard Lyle. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, I welcome what has been said, but I raised this issue because I recently had a constituent discuss this matter with me. Following the refusal of our local housing association to take part in the Scottish Government scheme, which I welcome the scheme, 
to fund the installation of a personal car charging point in its home. Can I ask, therefore, what further action can be taken to encourage the installation of such points and utilisation of gov uh, wonderful government initiatives in our local communities? Minister. Well, as I said to, to the member, we're investing heavily in, in the uh, electric uh, charging infrastructure. We have around about uh, 700 uh, charge points, around about 150 of them uh, are, are rapid uh, charge points. So we do believe that the infrastructure is hugely important. Uh, I would refer the member to that Switched on Scotland uh, action plan, which I mentioned previously. I obviously don't know the specifics of this case, but if it's helpful to the member, I'll have my officials make contact with that uh, housing association to see where the barriers may be uh, and see if there's uh, some sort of resolution to this particular issue. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Uh, before we come to First Minister's questions, members may wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery Her Excellency Tina Intelman, Ambassador of Estonia to the United Kingdom.